Thanks, John. This is a prayer for us. We're back into doing the remodel. Guidance. Safety. So, yeah, today we've been there today. It's quite my way. It's quite box. Yeah. Like I heard swim. That's a water saw that we were using. What else? Yes, Mike. September's a good month, right? Pray for uh, Suzanne that's come the last couple Sunday nights. I've got some thoughts on that, but I'll, I'll keep it to myself for now. I'll talk about it later. But we need to pray for her salvation, okay? Okay. Anybody else? Brother Gene, he and his wife, Jeannie, have been married forever. They're, they've gone through a lot together, but they're, they're a good testimony of a marital relationship. They are truly one person. And Jeannie has been stricken with cancer. And the prognosis is not good at all. She went into some more surgery this morning. And uh, haven't been able to get hold of Jean to see, you know, what the outcome was. But their family and all of us, we know, and Jeannie knows, his wife, that the end is very near. So just... And she knows the Lord. Uh, no. No. Well, for Jenny, we need to talk. If you want me to talk to her, I'll talk to her. All right? Whatever we can do to talk to her, we need to try to talk to her. Mm -hmm. All right, remember Jeannie. Anybody else? What? Annette has an unspoken.
quick to hear, some will say uh, swift, but quick to hear. And we discussed that uh, these directives then do pertain to God's Word, to the uh, expounding of His Word. Whenever we have the opportunity to hear God's Word, we should be quick to hear. And the second principle then also speaks about God's Word, and it speaks in regards to exposition of His Word again. And James says we're to be slow to speak God's Word. Okay? We're going to talk about that in more depth as we begin tonight. So in 1 Timothy 5.22 it says, Lay hands suddenly on no man. You know what that means? Lay hands suddenly on no man. Okay? Use discernment before you give him the okey -doke. Yeah, that's pretty close. Uh, in, the, in the ancient times, one way that they uh, affirmed a man's readiness for going into the ministry was they laid hands on him. Okay? And this is saying... Uh, in uh, 1 Timothy 5.22, it's speaking of that same type of idea where in the Old Testament, remember in the Old Testament they would lay hands on a sacrificial animal? Why would they lay hands on the animal? To identify with the animal, actually to place their sins on it. But the idea here is to don't, don't come upon a man, don't elevate a man to the position of teaching in a fast way. Take your time. Uh, in Ezekiel 3, in chapter 3 of Ezekiel and chapter 33 of Ezekiel, uh, the Lord speaks to Ezekiel and he tells him, uh, I've put you in a position of being a watchman on the wall. Okay? Remember that? And I'm going to, but if you mess up, and if anything happens to my people, uh, I'm going to blame you for the blood of the, for anybody that's lost. Okay? That's, that's, that's the idea of being a teacher, okay? So you have to be very careful how you treat the ministry. It's a very serious thing. Hebrews 17, 13 says, Those who rule over you, who teach you, who watch for your souls, have to give an account to God. All that simply means is that anybody that teaches you the word eventually will have to give an account for what they've taught you. Have to give an account to God. So any any one of us as believers needs to learn the dual truth that James starts with here. That we're be we're to be quick to hear God's word taught. We should be looking for every occasion, every opportunity within reason to hear His word taught, taking advantage of it, and at the same time we're to be, to be reluctant to offer ourselves to be placed in the position of preaching or teaching because we have a great sense of we have a great sense of the significance that it is. Okay? And usually if you ask your spiritual leader if they think that you're ready to teach, hopefully they will give you a an honest appraisal and will let you know. Uh, John Knox was a uh, a great Scottish clergyman and he was a leader of the Protestant Reformation. And he, uh, he's considered the, one of the founders of uh, uh, Presbyterianism. And he, when he was called to preach, his biographer says, this is a quote, he said, he burst, he burst forth in most abundant tears and withdrew himself to his chamber. His countenance and behavior from that day until the day he was compelled to present himself in the public place of preaching did sufficiently declare the trouble and grief his soul. He took the responsibility very heavily. Uh, for Knox, it was a frightening responsibility. So you have this, you have this, you have a positive command to receive the word with submissiveness, and you have a negative command as to the nature of that submissiveness. You see, we receive the word with submissiveness, and we, we teach the word with a certain reluctance uh, to step into that position because of all it entails, okay? If you think teaching is just intellectually preparing yourself to present God's Word, it's not. 
there once was a, there's a story about a young man who came to see the great philosopher Socrates in Greece. And he, uh, he wanted to be instructed in oratory by Socrates. And the, the moment the young man was introduced to Socrates, he began to speak. And he kept talking, and he kept talking, and he kept talking, and incessantly he kept talking. And Socrates finally was able to stop him and get in the word. He said, young man, to instruct you in oratory, I will have to charge you a double fee. To which the young man replied, why a double fee? Why is that? And the old sage replied, I will have to teach you two sciences. First, how to hold your tongue. And secondly, how to use it. Okay. So, the two things go together. There should be a certain reluctance before there's a willingness to speak. Now, apparently, the fellowship to which James is writing has a problem. And if you, if you read the book of James, if you read the book of James twice in the next week, you would be at, that problem would just run right into it. It would be so utterly obvious to you. Uh, evidently, the place to which James is writing, there's a lot of people shooting off their mouth. Look at verse 26. What does it say? If anyone of you, among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Okay? Uh, he's saying that they're a deceiver, in other words. Uh, and there's a lot of would-be teachers. Remember we looked at that first verse in the third chapter. What's that say? In 3.1, it says... My brethren, let not many of you become teachers. And I told you in the Greek that says, stop so many of you being teachers. That's the literal translation of that phrase in the Greek. Stop so many of you being teachers. So there's obvious there's a problem with people and what they have to say. There must be a problem. And he goes on after in that first verse of the third chapter, then he goes on for the next 17 verses, and what's he talking about? The tongue. The tongue. How bad the tongue is. How, de how detrimental the tongue can be to the body. You have to get your tongue under control. So obviously the church that James is writing to, there have been a problem with that. In 4.6, he talks about the, pro the proud in the church. They must have some proud people who wanted other people to hear what they what they have to say. In verse 7, he tells them that they need to learn to submit. Verse 10, 10 in, in chapter 4, he talks about, hum, about humbling themselves in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord will lift you up, you up and don't speak evil of one another. Uh, you know, uh, so there's a lot of uh, evidently verbal wrangling going on, a lot of evil speaking. And some people who wanted to teach you had no... Uh, right to teach you. Even over, you can go over to 5.9, it says that some of them, they were uh, uh, grumbling or murmuring against each other. So there's a theme that runs throughout the book of James, this issue. So James is trying to get people to understand the proper way to listen, the proper way to speak. So he, he says, learn to listen to the word every time you have an opportunity. In your outline, the word is opportunity, and learn to be very slow to be a teacher. Uh, if you want to, uh, being a teacher should be a compelling thing that you can't get away from, but you have to uh, do it with patience and with care. You have to make sure your heart's prepared and your mind's prepared until you're ready to speak the truth. Uh, you know, I don't get nervous talking in front of people anymore. Uh, I got over that a long time ago. But I, I hope I'll always be nervous about attempting to take what I think uh, God is trying to tell us in His Word, because that's a big responsibility. Uh, I don't want to mis misrepresent God to you. That's what makes me nervous. And I'm really about, I'm the same way about singing. I'm probably more nervous about singing than I am about teaching. Because when I, I, I really feel when I sing, and I've probably sang, you know, several thousand times over. I feel like when I sing, uh, I'm singing for the Lord, so that always makes me nervous. But the key thing here to remember is that 
of what we're attempting to do is rightly divide the word of truth. And that's a big responsibility. Remember what that word divide means? It means to draw a straight line. Paul used that word to do that's a word that you, you tent makers use. It means to cut a straight line on the tent material so that you don't waste anything. Every fit, everything fits together perfectly. When you divide the truth, it fits together perfectly. Uh, so, so listen to the word. He's supposed to become a teacher. And the third thing that the third thing that he says uh, in the, you know in, James is writing about a submissive type spirit. He says, submit yourself to the word. He says back in 120 in our source scripture, 119. He says, uh, be slow to anger. Some will say, be slow to wrath. Uh, and that comes from the Greek word, orge. O-R-G-E. That's how we spell it in English, but it's pronounced orge in the Greek. And it doesn't mean to be mad. It means to have a deep resentment inside of you. If it meant to be mad in the Greek, it would be the word thumos. T-H-U-M-O-S is thumos. That means to get mad, you know, start hopping around, yelling and screaming. That's when you blow up on the outside. But orge means to have a burning resentment within you, uh, a smoldering, something underneath the surface, a deep set seated rejection. So, uh, <coughs> Listen to what James is trying to say. He's saying, first of all, he's saying, be eager to hear. Listen to the word, be eager to hear it. Be very, very cautious before you speak it. And then third, when you hear something from the word, don't build up resentment within yourself because you don't agree with what you thought or because it confronts sin in your life. That's why people get upset with the truth. It, change, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't conform to their viewpoint of the truth or it confronts sin in their life. That's the issue. That's what James is writing about here. That's the issue here, is their, re, their reaction to the word. It refers to the disposition of their rejection. The context here is hearing the word, teaching the word, and it applies anger against those who teach the word or confront you with the word. Very often, I find people who differ with me in my teaching, they become very hostile. Uh, really hostile. And uh, to tell you the truth, I have seen less unregenerate anger than I have seen redeemed anger in my life. Did you get what I just said? I have seen less unregenerate anger than I have seen redeemed anger in my life. And uh, I'm not so sure why that is. Uh, you know, John MacArthur uh, speaks of the charismatics have been after John MacArthur for years about the gift of tongues. They've been fighting with him. And he, and he writes that when they approach him about the issue, these are Christians, they come to him fully in the flesh. They are in his face, they're yelling at him, screaming at him. Etc. Et They're mad. So, uh, why are they mad? Because he's saying something they don't agree with. But is that a reason for two for, for for brothers and sisters in the Lord to get mad at each other? I don't think so. But people who who differ can get very very hostile. You know, I could probably give you. A, a hundred illustrations of hostility, but I don't take the time to, to chronicle them, and I'm not going to waste your time here. But people who are convicted are hostile to the truth, and they don't want to hear it. And, uh, they may be believers, uh, and, but maybe they're not ready to hear what is trying to be uh, spoken to them. Uh, it's like in counseling. Okay, you have a you, you have, usually in marriage counseling. I try to meet. Both people first, then, dependent upon that meeting, I'll meet with a husband, and then I'll meet with a wife. So, but if you have a husband, okay, and the first thing you try to ascertain are, are you Christians? And, oh, yes, we're Christians. And then the husband will tell you, you know, the husband, oftentimes, the husband has already made up his mind what he wants to do. Uh, and then if you tell him, 
God's viewpoint, if he wants a divorce, even if he's a Christian, if you tell him God's viewpoint on divorce, guess what? He becomes hostile. Why? Because he doesn't want to hear what you have to say. He doesn't want to hear what God has to say about it. They've already made up their mind what they wanted to. So, so apparently, in this assembly of people to which James is writing, there was a lot of stuff flying around in the air. And there were murmurings and gossip and evil speakings and hostility. And in fact, if you notice back in, in chapter 4 again, it brings it right to, into focus. He says, this is in uh, chapter 4, it says, hey, listen, he's writing to a church, okay? Chapter 4, verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Sound like a church? Wars and fights. Where do they come from among you? And then he says, do they not come from your desires for pleasure? That war in your own members? Have you heard a church before about a church that wars and fights with itself? Uh, so he says that that warring and that fighting comes from their desires. You know what another word for desires is? I've taught you before. Whenever you see the word desires, put a slash and put lust next to it. L-U-S-T-S. -S. Lust. It comes from their lust. Because in, in some way or another, they become pitted against each other. Everybody wants to be heard. Everybody wants to have a voice. Everybody wants to have his own viewpoint. Everybody wants to have his own opinion. And there's an anger and a hostility. There's, a, there's these attitudes that are flying around in the church. And he says, you're not to be that way. You're to be slow to anger. You're to be slow to rejection. You're to be slow to resentment. Not fast. Slow. Because you know what happens when you're slow to those things? They have a habit of just going away. They take care of themselves. The Lord takes them from you. So... There would be a time when you might resent something that someone taught. Listen, if I teach you, uh, if I teach you an error, okay, and even after, and you should still, if I teach you an error, you should still be patient with me. You should still be cautious uh, to reject the things I teach you. But if you believe what I teach you in error is an error, then you have the right to bring it to my attention. But you don't have the right to be mad. You don't have the right to be resentful. You don't, you don't have any of those rights. Paul illustrates that in Galatians 4.16, where he's writing, and I, I think he's right on the same issue. He says he's given them, he tells them in, in Galatians, in, in that fourth chapter, Paul's telling them, I'm giving you the straight scoop. And then he says, am I therefore your enemy because I tell you the truth? And the answer to that question in the church in Galatia was yes. He was there some people's enemies because he had told them the truth, and they didn't want to listen to the truth. I mean, sometimes we want to hear the truth, you know. What we're trying to do here is to try to give us the best interpretation of the Word of God that we can. So James says you, you listen to the Word of God with every opportunity that you have. You, you're reluctant to speak it until you're really prepared to speak it, and you patiently accept what is taught and be very slow before you build up a resentment to that. He's, he's trying to put a lid on the hostility and the confusion that's at, his, at the place he's writing to. Why? Why is, he, why is he trying to do that? Why does he want to do that? Well, look at back in our source scripture. Look at the 20th verse. In James 1.20, he says, he, okay, so he says, Be slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So the wrath of man does not uh, produce the righteousness of God. The deep resentment, the rejection, the resistance to the teaching of the word does not produce the righteousness of God. And what does he mean when he says righteousness of God? Bible 101, what does he mean? The righteousness of God. Exactly. Something that pleases God. And what pleases God? That which is right before him. And if you're mad, if you're angry, you can't produce what is right before God. And again, there is the, and I don't want you to take me in the wrong way, there is just anger. There's anger over holy things. There's anger over the devil. There's anger over demons. There's the Lord Jesus who made a whip, right? 
and he cleansed out the temple, and he said, You turned my father's house, which is a house of prayer, he said, into a den of thieves. Okay? That's, that's, that's righteous anger. There is what we call holy indignation. There's a holy wrath. But that's entirely different than what we're talking about here. Don't, don't, don't resent, don't build up bitterness and animosity and anger in your heart because you don't want to hear what somebody says because you don't personally agree or because it, or, or because it confronts you. So a true believer then will desire to hear the word willingly. He'll speak the word only when he should because he's prepared, because he, he feels compelled to. And he won't exhibit any long-term hostility or resentment against biblical truth of the one who teaches it. And it's a very important message for the chaos at the assembly to which James is writing. So in other words, to sum up uh, those three things, receive the word with submission. Don't get angry. Listen carefully. Talk only when you're prepared, okay? So I've kind of gone back and over and over those things repetitively. So how you receive the word is crucial. Listen, how your heart is when you receive the word is crucial. And we see, we've seen that we're supposed to receive it with a submissive spirit. Secondly, the first thing is we should receive it with a submissive spirit. Secondly, there should be a willingness to receive the word with purity. In your outline, the word is purity. Very, very basic truth. There should be a willingness to receive the word with purity. Look at verse 21. It says, therefore, what else, what other do you have? What other words do you have? Therefore, wherefore. That comes from a Greek word, D-E-I, which really means for this reason. So he says, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of a God, for this reason, and he says, what does he say? For this reason, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. For this reason, these three things, and then for this reason, and he gives you this little list of things. Because, you know, he doesn't want anything to stop you uh, that doesn't please God. He wants you to exercise things that will please God. So for this reason then, put off filthiness. And for this reason, put off an overflow or an abundance of wickedness. Okay? Uh, there, now, another way to, to receive the word is with a pure life. And that's enveloped in this idea of purity. Because without purity, the righteousness of God... Listen, if you don't have a, a pure life tonight, it's hard. It's hard to receive God's work. It only makes sense. It's like a barrier. And if the more sin you have, the bigger the barrier, the deeper the barrier. Okay? So the idea of purity is very important in receiving the Word of God. Anger, other sins will hinder the righteousness of God from being produced because. If you've got sin in your life, does it please God? No. So if it doesn't please God, is he, is he going to do a lot of talking with you? His expectation of you is to get yourself right with Him. He offers you that opportunity. So He says to put off all filthiness, uh, this overflow of wickedness, and, and then He says, receive with meekness the implanted, uh, the implanted is probably the best word for the Greek word, uh, the, the implanted word which is able to save your soul. And the key word there is to receive. Okay? In that, in that sentence. And receive with meekness. The key word is uh, receive, but there's a vital participle before receive. And the participle is apo uh, And it means before you receive, you have to, what do you have to do before you receive? You have to put off, and that word is way back at the beginning of that one. Therefore, lay aside or put off. If you're going to receive, it, he says first that you have to do what? You have to put off. And both are in the aorist tense. So you could read, it could be translated.
translate, having put off, receive. Having put off, receive. You've, you've got rid of it, now you can receive. And you can continue to receive. And you will receive. And you have received, because you have put it off. So it would be best to understood. Listen, so it's best to understand, you cannot receive the implanted word of God until you put off your sin. So the point is, before the work can produce the righteousness of God, there has to be a putting off. There has to be a putting off has to take place in your life. You've got to unload some things. And that verb in the Greek, to put off, it originally meant to take off your dirty clothes. You've got to take off your dirty clothes. But then when it became a biblical phrase, because Paul loved that, that word, it became a, a, a biblical word and it meant to reject evil vices. It meant to get rid of sin in your life. Put it off. Paul loved to use this word. He uses it in Ephesians 4.22. He says in 4.22, Put off concerning the former manner of life, the old man, corrupt according to his deceitful life. Thus, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man. Colossians 3.8. Put off all these anger, malice, wrath, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing what you have put off. Again, he says, put off the old man with his deeds. Paul seems to think that putting off is very important. Hebrews 12.1 says, laying aside every weight in the sin that does so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And probably the best illustration is by Peter. 1 Peter 2.1 He says, therefore, and he uses the same verb as Paul, and he says, putting aside all evil, all deceit, all hypocrisy, and envy, and all evil speaking, then as newborn babes desire, see, put off, then as newborn babies desire to hear milk of the word, that you may grow. So be, the, the inference is, is that before you can take in the word and grow, you have to get the garbage out of your life. Okay? You have to get the garbage out of your life. And that's what he's saying. It's all by that same verb. It means to take away, put off, strip off. To sort of uh, pull the thought together then, since the word is, uh, is, is, is we, we, we often refer to the word as a seed. It needs good soil to grow in, right? So you need to put off the sin so you can have good soil for the word to grow in uh, in order to be fully, fully yielded to the divine influence of the word of God. The, the heart, we're taught in the word that the heart must be circumcised. What does that mean? When the heart is circumcised. What's put off? Evil. That's what it meant by a circumcised heart. Evil is cut away. Okay? Uh, and when you cut away that evil, there's more uh, receptivity of, available. So, and the, the word there that's uh, uh, translated filthiness is a fascinating word. Can I say that about a word that's filthiness? Can I say it's fascinating? It's used in uh, that word uh, in the Greek. It's horu. It's horu. It's R H O O horu. Baria. Ru. Ru. Baria. And it means uh, it means all. It means to be totally filthy. All filthy. So when we are told to put it off. Put off this filthiness, this paria, it means to get totally clean, comprehensively clean. But, uh, and, uh, and that word used to be used also of filthy clothes. And, uh, it, and it came to mean moral vice as it was used in the Bible. But it comes from a, a root word that's a great word. Rupos. Uh, the root word is it actually the root paria. And uh, in, in, in English, you would say, rupos, 
R-U-P-O-S. And it's a, uh, you know what rupos means? It means you have wax in your ears. Okay? So, follow me. Hippocrates and Clement both used this word, rupos, when they were talking about uh, morality. And what, what, it, what it's saying is, is get the dirty wax out of your ears so you can hear the word of God. Rupos. Uh, wax in your ear. Dirty wax in your ear. Pretty good. Uh, Pretty uh, vivid picture of what he's trying to tell you. That's what's that's what makes the Greek so interesting. But he's saying, don't get, don't let that evil and accumulate. Have you ever had wax in your ear? Don't let that accumulation of wax in your ear block your hearing. So uh, if you don't have it, then you you can hear better the word of God. You can hear it with purity. You can get rid of all that other junk. And he adds, uh, if it, as if he needs to add anything, he talks about this overflow of wickedness. And that comes from the Greek word katia, K-A-K-I-A. Uh, and katia is a Greek goddess. You've probably never seen katia. Uh, because she's a, she's a symbol of vice and moral blindness. And she's, uh, she looks very proud. She's very heavy. She wears a lot of makeup, and she wears very revealing clothing. She's not very attractive. Um, but that's kakia, and that's what he's talking about. That's the word that he uses for wickedness. And uh, so James, he, he's, uh, he's saying get rid of that filthiness, uh, which is the actual way of evil. And then he says get away, get rid of that wickedness, which is the, the intent of evil. Kakia was, her intent was always to commit evil. Uh, and the word overflowing is what uh, say and it means it just means an abundance. Abundant evil. All the prevailing evil around you. Get rid of all of it. The whole filthy mass of uh, wickedness that might be moral vice that might be around you. Get it all out of you. And then you can hear the word of God with the right kind of and you know, God's going to speak to the lost in the way that God speaks to the lost. But to the saved, he expects to have a certain platform to speak into. He has a certain expectation of the saved. In 1 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul says, I'm so thankful for you Thessalonians because you have received of God the word of God which you heard from us. You received it not as the word of men, but as the truth, the word of God which effectually works in you. In other words, you heard it, you listened, it changed your life. And in the 14th verse, he says, And you became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea were in Christ Jesus. You obeyed, and because you heard, they had clean ears. They didn't have any wax in your ears. And then finally, for tonight, uh, we need to be, if we're, if we're going to be willing to receive the, the word of God with submission, willing to receive the word of God with purity, the last thing is we need to be willing to receive the word of God with humility. Uh, in that 21st verse, it says uh, to, uh, to receive with meekness uh, the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Meek, meekness means humility, a submissive heart, a pure heart, a humble heart. You need to be willing to submit uh, you need to be willing to receive the word in humility. It means you are, and really what it means is that you need to have a teachable spirit. You listen, you submit, you purify your heart, and you set yourself, you set your ego down at the door before you walk into the church, uh, and then you're ready to receive the word. And the word meekness is a, it's almost untranslatable from the Greek. You could, you could, it's a, the word is prop. Prabhupes, and it, it means to be humble, gentle, meek. Uh, it's the picture of a willing spirit. But the best translation in this context is to be teachable. So he's talking to you in regards to the word. Remember, everything here pertains to the word of God. None of this, you know, people will teach us and they'll say, you need to be slow to speak. Well, that means you're supposed to think before you speak. That is not what that means. That's not what this says. This is all about the to be slow before you speak the word of God. People will look at this and they'll say, you need to be swift to hear. That means you need to be a good listener. That's not what this says. This means, this says when, 
top, you need to run around and get as much as an inch as you can in your head. It had nothing to do with being a good listener as people, uh, as, as society would teach you. So the idea uh, were to be teachable, receive. See, the Word of God carries with it an urgency. The Word of God carries with it an urgency. You should to welcome the Word with a teachable spirit. Your spirit should not be passive in nature. Your spirit should be very active in nature. And you outline the word exactly. Take it in, receive it with a teachable spirit, without resentment, without anger, without pride. And as you're receiving, why are you receiving? Well, look back into verse 21. You're receiving the implanted word, the infutos. It's infutos. That's a rich word. It means something that's, it means exactly what it says, something that's been planted in futos. And when the word is planted in your heart, when, when is the word planted in your heart? When is the word planted in your heart? When is the word planted in your heart? At salvation. The word is planted in your heart at salvation. Preaching of the gospel mixed with faith, the implanted word, the, the mixing of the gospel and the word touches your heart and, and plants within you an understanding. The Holy Spirit taught you, and it was put there at the moment of your salvation. It is there, it is rooted in your heart, and it's a very vital element of your new life. And, and, when, the, and, and when he says, the power and the effect of the root, rooted word is depending upon your willingness to receive it. It's remember we were talking about your radio tuner turn, turning into into God. Well, you've got that word in you. Once you get the station in, uh, narrowed in, all you got to do is turn on the volume. Turn up the volume. And how you how do you turn up the volume? By dwelling on the Word of God, by listening to the Word of God, by being eager to hear the Word of God, by not being resentful to the teaching of the Word of God. That's how you turn up the body. And, and why do you hear it? Why, why, why is it important? Why do you hear it? Why do you want to receive it with, need, with meekness and with a teachable spirit? Because it is able to do what? What does it say? It says that it saves your soul. That's a present participle, okay? It doesn't mean that it saves you. It, it means that it's powerful. It is, it, what it means is that it continually saves you. Christians get saved and they say, I'm saved. See, the idea is that the work continually saves you. Stay at home. The opportunity to hear the Word of God is a privilege. Amen. It's a privilege. So the idea is, is that you will allow yourself to be taught. It will continually save your soul. It will make your life better. It will make your family lives better. It will, it will build you up. Not only will it you receive it at salvation, it will keep on saving you until the day of your full and your ultimate salvation. There's a sense in which we are saved, yes, but there's a sense in which we are continually being saved. There's a sense that we are being saved right now, here tonight. And in the Word is what sustains you through the whole process to your ultimate glorification and salvation. Thank you.